Hello. Hello. Welcome to our live feed. We're going to do a tour. Welcome to Foodscaping Utah. I'm John. Holly's behind the camera. If you're there live, let us let us know you're there. Send us a chat. Um, let's see. So we can start on one end of our foodscape uh, and we'll kind of move through and show you the plants that we're growing. We'll throw in there uh, lots of information and tips about pests um, and about how to tell when things are ripe and harvest and basically show you what we've got. Um, let's start here with this squash arbor. So this is a uh, cattle panel um, trellis or arbor we like to call it. I'm going to so. step out so you can see the whole thing. Okay. Well, now they won't be able to hear me. <laughs> Just for a minute. All right. Um, all right, there you go. Got a good view of it. This is a um, cattle panel trellis or, or like a uh, wall fence, right? And you just bend it over. So it's a really cool way to make a uh, arbor to grow climbing vegetables on. I've seen some people even do grapes on it. Grapes get really heavy though, but um, if you come in here, you can see that we've got, this is called a trombetta squash and the squash is uh, starting to hang down and it just is filling in. This is the coolest time. Um, August is when it all fills in. So we're growing this trombetta squash and then on this side we've got some baby butternut squashes which are winter squashes so they'll be ready a little bit later. There's probably a few little ones starting to form. Let me see if I can find one for you. Uh, maybe not too many yet. What happens with squash plants is, here's a little tiny one. What happens with squash plants is they put male flowers on uh, lots before female flowers. So the male flowers are these ones. Okay. That's a, male flower. That's a male flower. And this is a male flower. And it doesn't have um, the fruit behind it. So the male flowers come on first. Then the plant says, okay, I'm big enough. I've got enough male flowers to pollinate the female ones. And then the female plants start forming. So uh, there's a couple of them, but I haven't seen very many female ones. So we hopefully we'll get them pretty soon because we want to make sure we have enough time to ripen them uh, before the um, first frost. That's what we're shooting for. But winter squash, we don't really expect to harvest those until September or November. Um, if you have questions on squash, um, let us know. Uh, let me throw in there real quick that the number one pest um, for squash and it most people know about it if they've grown pumpkin zucchini or any kind of squash is squash bug and the number one tip that we have is is know when the squash bug eggs are gonna come and that's mm -hmm. here that's usually what Holly June yeah. it's probably mid-June um, and come out and monitor for the eggs look up what they look like monitor for the eggs Usually you find them on the back of the leaves mm -hmm. and then we just remove them with like rolled over duct tape or there's a different bunch of different ways to remove them. But let us know if you have questions on that. Um, so in these beds, well, obviously we've got the squash there. And then on this side, we had some celery and nasturtiums on this side, uh, fava beans and lettuce on the other side as our spring crop but we've already taken all of that out and now our fall crop is coming up. So these little plants here are carrots. These are carrots. This is remnants of celery actually where I cut them out. I just cut out the old plants, leave the roots in and then sowed seed um, for carrots there. These are carrots that I did maybe two weeks before those. And then this is parsnip. Um, the parsnip's been in the ground since late June and it's been since about mid July for the carrots. Um, so they're great to grow in the fall. Um, on, let's go this way real quick first, right? Uh, this is a uh, espalier apple, horizontal tiers. So you can see a few fruit on there. We actually harvested some off of the I wonder if it's the sun or the internet. There we go. I think we're back. Hello? Hopefully we're back. Looks good. If, you, if you're still with us, uh, send a chat to let us know. 
Maybe the going out to the street was too far for the internet. Maybe. Yeah. Um, looks like we've got Janet who's on. And Larry and Sharon are on. <laughs> okay. Great. So Hi, guys. They can so, see us, I think, still. Okay. Um, do you think it was working during the squash bug? I think, yes. Okay. And then talking about squash. So, um, on that end there, can you just move around here so we can just look? Um, on, on that end there, we've got the apple, uh, the Asian pear, and then a European pear. The Asian pear espalier looks really cool right now because we got the fruit and we took the bags off. That's another pest to mention real quick. Um, with pears and apples, um, codling moth is a major pest. And um, so we use organza bags. Uh, if you're familiar with our channel, you probably already have heard this before, but we put those on when the fruit is about the size of a quarter. Um, and here that's usually in June. And that prevents the moth from laying uh, eggs on it. And these are an early pear. It's a Bartlett type. The um, variety is called Haro Delight. So they're just about ready to harvest. And the way that we tell when pears are ready is we just kind of lift them with our hand like this. And if they come off fairly easily, that means it's ready. Um, you do actually don't want to wait until they're soft on the tree. So we probably need to come through and pick them, most of these pears if they all come off. Um, you don't want to wait till they're soft on the tree. You want to let them soften on the counter. So but they, you, be, they need to be they mature be too. When you take them off the tree. Well, they have to be mature. Um, let's go back towards the internet. They, they have to be what? I was gonna go around that way. Oh, okay. Where I was <laughs> um, they uh, have to be mature, but they don't want to be soft yet. Um, for the best quality, you want to wait till they like come off easily and then let them ripen on the counter, which only takes about a week. So if you want to extend your harvest, put harvest, put all the ones in, that you're not going to eat right away in the refrigerator and then pull them out about a week before you want to eat them. It's great because um, you can extend it over a long period of time. This is a little apple tree that I grafted and we're trying to keep it extremely small which has been a little bit hard on it maybe, but it's uh, kind of the experiment on how small we can take it, keep it. And we got a couple on there. Zestar's the variety. Um, and then these are pluots. We just finished eating most of the pr pluots fruit off of these. But with stone fruit, <clears throat> it's really the same thing. Let's see. I don't know, you won't be able to see any fruit, right? I'll take one off though, real quick to show you. It's really the same thing where you just lift it softly from the bottom and if it comes off, that means it's ripe. The fruit, I like to think of it like the tree wants to give you the fruit when it's ready, you know? Um, if, obviously if they fall off uh, the tree themselves, it's a little too late, um, but that's a good indicator that they're ripe. Um, so these are bush beans and you can see they're flowering. We've had a few beans on them, but they're just getting started. Hi, I think Cindy was on, Cynthia. Okay. So here we have bush beans. That's the, the squash trellis again. Um, this is amaranth. Here's amaranth. What is amaranth, John? I think a lot of people don't know. Amaranth is an ancient grain um, from South America, primarily, I think originally in Central America, Mexico. It's um, is really pretty. This variety is called Love Lies Bleeding, uh, but it's a grain that we we actually do harvest some of it. Okay, so we're we might be having internet trouble. Um, we're gonna have our kids get off of uh, Netflix and see if that helps. But I'll um, fill in while we're doing that real quick. Here on this row here is a, you can see a couple of really good things. Uh, we've got uh, amaranth and zinnias at the end. The trellis there were pole beans that we saw just a second ago. And then we also have um, peppers. I think I can hold the camera too. Well, Holly will be back in just a second. Um, so here we have uh, peppers and celery. And these are a few more bush beans that we mixed in. 
This pepper here is uh, a sweet pepper, but then you can see we mixed in, there's some jalapenos, Holly's back, celery, you can see the jalapenos, and let's see, this is poblano, and these aren't quite mature, but we've already been getting a harvest off of some of those. Um, and it's getting pretty dense in here, and it does usually in August. And that's okay. I like to plant vegetables densely to make sure that you don't, or one of the benefits of doing that is uh, sunlight doesn't get down to the soil, so it helps you conserve water. So I'm always trying to think about how you can most efficiently use your space. If you get them too dense and too crowded, that can be bad um, for diseases potentially, because you want a little air circulation in there. But a factor is how much sun you have. The more shade, the more space you need in between them. So in this area, we don't have any shade at all. It's full sun from the time the sun goes over the mountain until sunset. So we can plant them really, really um, densely here. So internet working okay? Yes, I think that right. was a problem. Yeah, shoot. Sorry about that. Um, here we've got tomatoes. This is sun gold. Uh, which is a super sweet cherry tomato. It's, it's one of the most um, commonly planted tomatoes, but it's so good that we usually always have to plant one. Um, this is a determinant variety in a tomato cage that, as you can see, like even these big sturdy tomato cages, sometimes they, uh, the tomatoes outgrow those too, depending on how vigorous the, the plant, the actual variety is. This one's a hybrid, so it's, it's pretty vigorous. We plant some hybrids and some heirlooms. Um, this one is a nice big pretty fruit and it produces really well so it's nice to have it. Um, let's see. Here we have grapes. It's getting pretty dense in here. So sometimes for grapes in the summer I thin them out a little but the main pruning for grapes is in the winter um, or like late winter early spring. We usually do it end of February early March here in Utah. Here you can see a shot. Um, we always mix in a lot of flowers with the design. This is borage, and I don't know, can you get in there to see the marigold? Um, and we already talked about the zinnias and the amaranth. Um, in the front here, usually when I design it, I kind of have one side mirror the other. So on one side there, we had a big amaranth plant, same over here. Okay, uh, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we'll head over to the other side real quick. Mm -hmm. um, here's another cattle panel uh, arbor. We just bent it over and these are T posts and attached it. And then in the spring we grew peas on there, um, garden peas. And then now these are pumpkins. And this is when it looks the best. Uh, they just filled in and it's really exciting. It's cool to see the flowers and soon we'll have more pumpkins um, hanging down. But we've got a couple on here we can show you. Obviously they haven't started to turn red yet, or excuse me, orange yet. Okay, is it going or not? All right. Okay, hi guys, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to flip this around and just talk to you for a second. If you're still there, hang with me. Hi. Uh, okay. So, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, sorry for the internet trouble again. Um, let's see, how much are we watering our plants right now is a question, thanks. Um, the uh, plants right now in the front bed, in the front where it's full sun, and they're growing in raised beds with a lot of organic matter. They have really good drainage. We're watering once a day. We never water twice a day, um, but we're watering once a day, and they are, um, it's drip irrigation lines that go for about an hour. The key to watering is, uh, usually that you want the the water you want to water long enough with whatever system you have either uh, drip irrigation or uh, by hand or sprinklers whatever you have you want to um, water long enough that the uh, 
water penetrates six to 12 inches. Hey, Hall, will you get on the chat on yours real quick? Okay, um, so six, you wanna penetrate the water, the whole area, six, at least six inches deep. Uh, most of the roots are actually in the top six inches, but if you can get them um, that deep, that can really uh, help. And, you know, I, in these raised beds, I try to water the whole root zone, which I think is usually gonna be about 12 inches. Depending on your, on your um, soil compaction, you might have roots. But right now it's 60 minutes on drip irrigation and it's, uh, it's every day. Um, but it's been really hot. So actually we're gonna back off um, pretty soon, especially when we have a full mature fruit and we want that to ripen. Um, and you don't wanna to have too much water late in the season. So as the weather cools and the plants need to, to start ripening the fruit, we back up, back off on the, on the weather, or excuse me, on the watering a little bit. Um, so let me set this down. Send us any other questions. Holly's gonna get on the chat and let us know if we have other questions. One thing I wanted to talk about um, when I'm sure that the internet feed is, is working well um, is when, when people think about plant problems, um, you know, a lot of times we're out looking for insects and a pest or a disease, and those are all um, uh, important things to do, especially insect pests. I think you should know what pests you, you have trouble with, know what they are, learn about them, and then monitor for them. That's like the key. If you, if you wanna find them as soon as you can. Um, but if there's some sort of uh, pest that you know is common in your area and is gonna be a problem, uh, it, you, you, as soon as you find it, removal is usually the first thing or some sort of um, physical barrier. Like if you use row cover, insect netting, or with the squash bugs, if you were here when I talked about squash bugs, if you find those eggs early in the season and you get all the eggs off, like, so I would check once a day Holly does a really good job of that and I help and then we come out and even our kids will get out here and try to find squash bugs, especially if they're excited about their pumpkin plant, right? And uh, they turn over the leaf, find the eggs, and if you remove that hole and take out the whole first generation, then you don't have near the trouble the rest of the season. Um, that's kind of key because with squash bug, they can decimate a plant really quick. Um, but, so know your pests and monitor for them, but um, the other thing is a lot of times when people find uh, a, 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 a plant that's having problems, most uh, problems on plants, like if you see leaf problems, most of them are actually from environmental causes. They're called ab abiotic plants or problems. So it's not something living. It's not a bacteria, a fungus, or, or an insect. It's just that the plant has some sort of physio physiological response to the conditions. So if it's super hot, you're gonna have some leaf curl on your tomatoes. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong, like it's a pest or a disease. It might, um, but 90% of the time it's, it's, it's not. So um, what I would always suggest if you're having any trouble is start with the, the environmental things, which is always gonna be soil, um, sun, and water. So if it's getting enough sun, that's number one. And if I, like, and you can you can do that in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of your season. Like if your plants get too crowded, you know, take one out. Um, we actually, I actually grow a super early little cherry tomato. Um, it's called Gold Nugget. And this is a little dense plant, and we plant it just so we can have a whole bunch of cherry tomatoes in July. And then when it starts getting crowded with all the other tomatoes, we pull those out. Um, somebody just said, asked, posted a picture on Facebook, I think. Oh, okay. So you can what grab that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, why don't you come? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, and you could attach the microphone if you want. So, um, basically the, uh, the number one thing to do with your plant is, hi, <laughs> the number one thing to do is make sure your, your plant is healthy and check the water. Uh, watering here in Utah when it gets super hot and dry is tough. In July it's tough. Like you have to, I would suggest monitoring your, um, Monitoring your your soil moisture as much as possible. 
The best way to know if, if your plants are getting enough water or too much is to check the soil. You can do that with a screwdriver, you can do that um, with a little shovel, or you can get a soil moisture meter. Um, Holly's going to try to get on and see if we have any other questions. Sorry okay. for the Hopefully internet trouble. You guys can Hopefully you guys can see us, she says. <laughs> um, so those are my main tips for pests. The, the other thing, the other major pest that we always know we have to deal with is, is codling moth. Um, and that if, it would only be a, a pest for you if you have apples or pears. Um, and then with peaches and nectarines, you might you have a borers. Codling moth is super pre, uh, prevalent. So anybody who has apples and pears in Utah, at least, and I think all over, need to worry about that and, and monitor or protect them with uh, organza bags like we do. Um, for, okay, yeah. Uh, we do have another question sure. about um, rodents. Someone's had trouble with bulls eating their um, potato and carrot plants this year. So uh, rodents is, is super tough. Um, there, I don't have like a magic tip if you do grow in raised beds one thing i um that i know people do who have that trouble like say you did a 12 inch raised bed like these what you can do is is put um hardware cloth or like uh um under like at the bottom of the 12 inches right and then the the bowls can't um dig in from underneath i think that would probably be the only sure way to get rid of them um, since we haven't had that problem, I haven't done too much research on um, uh, traps or baits or those kind of things. So for that, I would suggest uh, checking out uh, USU Extension should have, I'm pretty sure I've seen there, they have a, what they call a fact sheet, which is all the information about uh, voles uh, in, the, in the garden. So I Google voles um, garden USU and, you sh and that should come up. Um, they would have information on trapping and that kind of thing. But usually with a pest like that, any sort of animal, the, the surest way <laughs> is going to be a physical barrier. So like that's where I was talking about row covers for insects that fly or um, if, you, if you fence it off or something. For deer, for example, can be a real problem if you have a lot of deer. You might have to fence your, your garden area. Um, let us know if you have any other questions. Um, let's see. The other thing um, for pests and for gardening in general um, is when you want to, when you're learning to garden, um, I think it's one of the main things that you can do is come out, try to come out once every day. And it doesn't have to be for a, a long period of time but if you catch something and notice it on a leaf early enough that makes a huge difference because then you can figure out what it is do a little bit of homework and and try to figure out what it is so you can manage it okay go ahead okay. Holly so we got the picture on Facebook here yeah okay I'll take a look at that is the roly-poly eating the oh yeah so we had a question on Facebook about um, roly polies. Some people call them pill bugs. Yeah. Um, and typically they don't eat live plants. Typically what they do is eat decaying matter. So most of the time when you see them in your garden bed, that's not a bad thing. But um, somebody just sent us a picture and it looks like they're eating her live plant. They're, they're right on the plant. Thanks for the picture. Nice, nice job. And you can see my face in, in, in reaction that I'm surprised if you, if you, guys can see if you haven't picture. seen it um, on Facebook. There's, there's the picture. And, you know, um, I guess one question is, uh, are, do you have any idea, if you're listening still, it, were, was there any damage to that stem before the roly pulleys got there? The only thing I'm hypothetically thinking, and it's probably not, but maybe there was already some dead um, tissue there and they went up to, to, to start eating it. And assuming not, um, you know, I don't know what the best practice is. Um, typically uh, with roly pulleys, most of the information that's out there is for when they come into your home. Um, then obviously it's a problem. You've got something going on where there's a big infestation. 
So I did look that up this morning uh, before I answered your question there. They, um, USU does have a, a PDF fact sheet on uh, really, it, I think they call them pill bugs in there, but also roly pulleys um, that you can look up and see what kind of, you might have to bait them out of that area if they are actually, cher that looks like a pepper plant. If they're, if they're, if they're destroying your pepper plant, then I would definitely do something. You can definitely pick them, pick them off, but there might be some kind of easy bait that you can either purchase or make. Um, you know, with earwigs, people use oil um, and a little bit of baking grease or something that attracts them. I'm not sure what it would be for for roly polies. Um, but we can post that in the comments too on there. Yeah, the USU fact the USU sheet. Fact sheet. Yeah. Um, any other Looks questions like while we're hanging out? Um, they were eating seedlings. Anything that eats seedlings, that's never any fun. That's not bad at all. That's not good at that's all. That's not good at all. So yeah, yeah. we'll post that um, link in the comments. Roly polies are, are going to be in the ground too. So something like a, like a um, row cover wouldn't actually help probably. Right. Um, maybe there's a, a lot of organic matter in that area. The other thing is they like um, wet areas. So if you could let the soil dry out or if the plant is getting really wet from, from sprinklers, you could try to let it dry out a little bit. Um, they they kind of tend to, to build up where there's a lot of uh, moisture. Speaking okay. of water, um, blossom end rot on tomatoes is something that a lot of people have been asking about. Um, yeah. What's your tips for that? For blossom end rot, okay. And so, what is it? Okay, yeah, uh, blossom in raw sounds like a disease, uh, but it's really a nutrient deficiency. Uh, it's when the plant, and it's most commonly seen in tomatoes and peppers, and it's when the plant can't get enough uh, calcium to the fruit. Um, and there's a number of reasons that happens. The common USU uh, line is that there's an, it, it's probably not a calcium deficiency. And, and I totally agree with that, of course, um, unless um, you're growing in a container, okay? So assuming you have some native soil in your growing mix and you're not in, in a pot with potting soil, then it's probably not because there isn't enough calcium in the soil. So um, if you're in a pot, then think about the amount of calcium too. But in, even in these raised beds, these beds have native soil in them. Uh, we usually have a, this, these ones aren't quite 50-50, but we usually have native soil and compost 50-50. There's gonna be plenty of calcium in the, in the soil. So then blossom end rot is caused um, typically by, by uh, environmental stress. Again, going back to that, if, if, the, if the plant is struggling to have enough water to get uh, the calcium from the cement rot, um, the thing to do then is is really check your watering. There we go. We're back for sure. Okay. Uh, sorry. To, the thing with blossom end rot is you really want to check your watering schedule. Make sure that the soil um, is is not too wet, uh, but definitely not too dry. If it gets really dry, and in a bunch of water really dry and sometimes there's it's almost um, unpreventable um, if the if it's so hot and dry that there's no way you can keep the stress the water stress off the plant um, typically paste tomatoes like San Marsano have have a little bit more trouble getting the calcium to the fruit so you, it's more common there so you might have it on on your paste tomato but uh, or your Roma or your San Marsano or Amish paste, but you might not have it on some of your other tomatoes. Um, but typically hybrids are a little better uh, at that, but we love the heirloom flavors. So we plant those too. And the San Marsanos we love. And does blossom end rot, would that be something if you saw something similar like that brownish at the bottom on your peppers? Is that the same thing? Yeah, so blossom end rot definitely affects peppers. Um, it's most common on tomatoes. I think it can even affect squash. We've never seen it on squash, um, and it's less common in peppers. They do; they typically can manage it better. The other thing that um, uh, a friend Casey uh, sent us a picture of, and Jason, um, is sun scald, and sometimes you see that. And what made me think of it is peppers. It's really common on peppers. So um, 
it's basically where the sun it gets so hot and the fruit is so exposed that the sun burns the tissue um, so sometimes that can look like blossom in rot but uh, the best way to tell the difference is the blossom in rot will be right at the at the bottom of the fruit where the flower was where the blossom was um, but sun scald so if you get a lot of that you um, you won't see it on the interior of the plant as much where there's leaves that kind of shade the fruit. I don't think we have any in our peppers or achillea. But we have before. But we have before. Um, like, you know, you'll get like a whole section here that's kind of grayed out and burnt and then it dries. And blossom end rot looks a little more brown than gray. I yeah. would say. Oh, here's some sun skull. Oh, yay! No. That's just ripening. Coloring. Yeah, so this 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 um, pepper is really cool. That might be a little bit of sun scald right there, actually. Yeah, there it is. I also Hopefully see... you can still see that. But this, this pepper is really cool because it, it starts green and then goes yellow and then goes orange and then red, which a lot of peppers do, a lot of sweet peppers. Well, we're this is a sweet here, pepper. I see another pest we could talk about. Okay. On that chard. See that whitish? What's that? <laughs> I like how you set that up. <laughs> that whitish um, piece on there. Let me grab it. Um, so this is leaf miner, and it's very common on Swiss chard and on spinach. They're in the same family. Um, so the the what it is is it, it's a little uh, larva that um, watch out for my glasses there. It's a little larva that mines the inside of the leaf. So it's inside the leaf. Um, uh, that's another case where we do um, monitoring. Oh, did you want to see it again? So sometimes you get the whole leaf looks like that, and it looks like a disease. But that that's definitely an insect insect problem, and it's leaf miner. And our approach to that is is basically the same as it is for squash bug. We try to monitor particularly well early in the season um, when you first have spinach or, or Swiss chard early if you can get out there they have little white eggs and they form a little pattern it's like a like a cylinder very small like two millimeters uh, egg uh, and you can rub those off or, or remove them somehow or um, if once the leaf miner is in the leaf it's it's too hard to get it out so it's about get, getting the eggs and honestly we stop monitoring for leaf miner usually i don't know probably by july even even in into june we're already well, now we're looking at squash bugs so um we don't worry about the leaf miner too much because the good thing about that is if you have a lot of flowers and you have a lot of beneficial insects around um, some wasps and hoverfly will um eat your leaf miner for you so so they'll 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 attack the the larva of the hoverfly will come in as a beneficial predator and help you with your leaf miner. And by then also we're, we're a little sick of Swiss chard sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, and with beets, I'm sorry, beets is the other one. So spinach, Swiss chard, and beets are the primary vegetables where, where you're gonna have to worry about leaf miner. With beets, we don't actually worry about it as much as long as it looks like the beets are forming. And you can definitely eat beet greens. I know people that love them, um, but for us, it's more about the about the beet itself. But in the Swiss chard and the spinach, we don't want the whole plant to be covered with that. So the two tips there are monitor, get the eggs off early, and then attract a lot of beneficial insects. And we have a YouTube video on that, and I think a blog post where we talk about beneficial insects and how to bring them in. Honestly, that's our number one pest tip, I would say. Keep your plants extremely healthy, as healthy as you can. Make sure they're in the right spot. They've got plenty of sun, plenty of water. They have really good soil. And then a healthy plant is gonna be a lot more resilient when there's other kinds of problems like pests. They'll fight them off their own, on their own. Typically, so say you have just one more quick thing, like aphids are another common pest that people like to know about. Say you have four broccoli plants and one of them's unhealthy, that's gonna be where all the aphids are. Um, and it's, it's because, uh, I mean, and I don't know if it's the flavor or the pheromone or what, uh, but the insects gravitate towards the unhealthy plants and the healthy plants are able to fight them off. Like they have a better immune system. It's like healthy people, right? They don't get as sick and they don't have as many problems. So it's, it's um, 
I think the number one tip always for, for plant problems is, is getting the conditions as good as you can. So that's why we love raised beds because people can start with perfect soil and, and put them in the perfect spot. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, should we wrap it up or? Feel free to shoot more questions. I don't mind asking questions. I know it's been kind of hard with the live uh, because we've had some internet trouble. <laughs> you know, we did a test uh, before we started and it worked great. And then I think our kids uh, got on the internet and we told them they could, it's totally our fault. Um, but then they started using some of our bandwidth. So I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we'll uh, think of that next time for sure if we do try to do another one. Are there a few people still on? I think so, yeah. And if anybody has any questions, I was just going to say um, with the pests, like uh, basically you're just keeping the population of the pests under enough control yeah. to where your beneficial insects can take care of the rest. Honestly, this we just tolerate. You know, it's not as pretty, but you can still eat it. It's not that it's not edible. Or if that part grosses you out, you know, just eat this part, right? Um, honestly, we tolerate a little bit. Um, and then the, let's see. Yeah, like Holly said, um, it's never about eradicating pests. You know, like uh, it, it would be nice to never have to worry about them, but you know, make your foodscape part of an ecosystem and create a healthy place for, the, for your food to thrive and try to work with nature is kind of our approach to it. So we're gonna have, we're gonna rely on beneficial insects and monitoring as our major ways to deal with pests. If something gets in, in uh, terribly out of control, uh, hopefully you never get to that point, but then that's when you would consider um, other like sprays or, or something like that. Um, but not in our case, we don't, we don't uh, usually have to spray anything. Um, so before I let you go, um, post another question if you want, but while we're waiting to see, just wanted to let you know um, that in a week from today, uh, we'll be at the Ogden Farmer's Market. We're gonna sell some uh, vegetables and fruit, some of the ripe fruit, hopefully, um, uh, to raise money for the nonprofit Foodscaping Utah. Um, and this Thursday coming up, we're, we're gonna do an Instagram live takeover, or an Instagram takeover of the uh, Farmer's Market Ogden page. And then two weeks from today is when I'm gonna do a TED Talk at, at TEDx Ogden. Is it two weeks from today? Two weeks from today. Better get ready, right? The 22nd. Better get ready. So, um, what's that? Two, two questions. questions. Um, just let me finish the mm -hmm. TED Talk idea. The, um, the title, I, what's the title? Foodscaping our front yards for our health, our communities and our world. Um, and we're really excited about that. There's only a few tickets left for a limited audience if you want to come in person and then afterwards it'll be available on YouTube and I think they're even going to stream it, stream it on Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. So let it's, us know if you have questions. And it's TEDx Ogden is the website and the Facebook. TEDx Ogden. Um, TEDx Ogden so Facebook a, and we website. Got a, sorry. We got a question here about the soil in our raised beds. Can yes. Can talk about that? Sure. What it is? Yeah. How do you condition your soil for the raised beds? Okay. So um, our for soil for raised beds, the first thing uh, when people first get started, I think time of year is a factor. Um, I'll tell you what we did with these uh, uh, first, but, and then you can ask if there's other possibilities. But we, in the fall, um, uh, gathered coffee grounds from coffee shops with five gallon buckets. We left them there and they give it to you for free, which is awesome. And we gathered brown leaves from all of our neighbors. We just put up a sign and went and asked people and they're just, you know, thrilled to not have to put them in the trash or take or have to take them to the green waste, although that's a much better option than the trash. Anyway, get as much organic matter as you can. Um, coffee grounds are good, but you could have vegetable scraps or juice pulp or whatever you have um, and can get a lot of. And you can mix that in. And the reason I say I like to do that more in the fall is that gives it time to break down before you plant in the spring. Um, so then we also put in some native topsoil and don't worry if you're worried or if you think your, your soil isn't very good, just put up to 50 to 60% of that, uh, lots of organic matter and then finished compost. So these actually probably only had 20, 25% of native soil when we first did them because we had so many leaves and coffee grounds, but, and we even put a few, um, uh, pruning branches, like cuts, pieces of wood in the very bottom. 
and that's fine to do, but I like it at the bottom. And then we kind of um, mixed and layered the, the coffee grounds and the leaves, and then we put some soil and a couple layers, mixed it, and then at the top, all finished compost. So if you don't have access to the green, uh, uh, the compost or the green uh, organic matter, then uh, I would suggest uh, just doing a 50-50 mix of your topsoil, or you could order topsoil in if it's too hard to get to some of yours, and, and finished compost. And our favorite um, compost for this is green waste compost. So if you happen to be in Ogden, um, Ogden City has a, has a green waste facility and they have excellent compost, um, but you could check to see if your local waste management has something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can get compost at a nursery, but it's way cheaper if you get it local. And, and then you're reusing a source. Any follow-up questions on that? Uh, do you re recommend removing dead leaves from the vegetables to do to deter bugs? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, do we recommend removing dead leaves? So one reason our foodscape looks good, <laughs> I think, is uh, if I see anything dead, uh, Holly too, but if we see anything dead or, or yellowing, we take it off. Um, and that can be an indication of something uh, like... We actually have some yellowing. Let's show them if you can real quick. Maybe you don't have to come all the way over just because of the internet. Um, but this, this is most likely nitrogen deficiency, actually. Um, we haven't talked about fertilizer and we can in a minute, but I take these off. But this is the plant telling me if, it, if it's the oldest leaves and this growth is still pretty green, that are yellowing, it could be a nutrient deficiency. Um, it could also just be the plant's done with those leaves and it's um, a little bit environmentally stressed, like it's been so hot, it doesn't have enough water and it sacrifices the oldest leaves first, right? So it, I take these off, but then I think, okay, does this look like nitrogen deficiency or is it just stress? And you might fertilize a little in that case. Um, while we're talking about fertilizer real quick, we, we very seldom fertilize. So with our raised beds, um, every fall we add uh, more uh, brown leaves and more coffee grounds and compost, just a little bit of the uh, uh, coffee grounds and brown leaves and then top with compost. And that's really most of our fertilizer. We don't actually put a product on most things. Um, if it's a plant that I know needs a lot of extra nitrogen, we might give it a little extra nitrogen. Or this case, this is an indication that those plants kind of ran out of nitrogen probably. So I used an organic fertilizer. Blood meal is an organic uh, um, fertilizer, particularly for nitrogen, because I know these beds don't need any phosphorus or, or potassium because they've got lots of that, maybe even too much with all the organic matter in there. Um, so this is probably nitrogen if it's anything. And then, um, other than that, we, we, other than a little blood meal, when I think the plants might need it, um, we don't fertilize at all our vegetable beds. It's really the compost that does it. Another question? Mm -hmm. or, okay. When would a uh, pest or a disease require removing the entire plant as opposed to just the dead parts? Um, if you are there for a follow-up, what plant would it be? You know, I think that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, if, like if, leaf miner, for example, we wouldn't really move the whole plant. No, so, well, it depends on the time of year, maybe. So if it's, so let's take leaf finer, for example. If my entire, um, if typically with something like that, if a stress plant, it's got a lot of pests on it, it's gonna be the oldest leaves. And with Swiss chard, for example, you might see some new baby leaves emerging at the bottom, okay? And let's say it's June and there's a lot of season left and you wanna have Swiss chard later, I would take off every single one. You can even cut Swiss chard or spinach or lettuce. You can cut it all the way off, all the leaves, and its root system will still be there and it'll regenerate new growth. And then that new growth wouldn't have um, the leaf miner yet, right? So then you could get out there and start managing it. Um, when it's later in the season, you might not have as good a chance for regrowth of things. So depending on, what it is, right? depending on what it is, yeah, if it's a vegetable, you might be time to just rip the thing out. And also, you know, factor in if you have, if you want a little extra space for another plant or you might plant something else in that spot. 
I do remove, like I said, sometimes I remove a whole tomato plant to give the others room or because I want to put some carrot seed in or something for a fall crop. Um, if anybody's interested in fall vegetable planting, uh, now's kind of the end of the window. You can plant spinach and, and lettuce now probably through mid-month, but think about doing that if you want to. Another question? Yeah, we got a question about spraying fruit trees. When yeah. You, when you do that, if you do that? Uh, it depends on the pest. So that's the first thing to know is what pest might be the problem. Um, we deal with codling moth and, and two different types of borers for peaches uh, and nectarines and also on our almond, almonds. Um, okay, so number one tip for any insect pests and fruit trees is uh, if you're in Utah, sign up for USU IPM pest advisories for fruit trees and they'll tell you when in your particular area you need to spray or what the active pest is at that time. The first time codling moth is active, there'll be a pest advisory and we'll let you know if you need to spray and with what um, right when it happens. So what we do um, is for codling moth, if you were with us earlier, I mentioned organza bags. We put organza bags on and we know because we've been doing it for long enough now when to do that. Um, but we still watch the pest advisories to make sure we get them on early enough. Um, but if you were going to spray, that's typically when the fruit is, it, it's usually early June. This year it was actually late May, wasn't it? They were ahead of schedule. The apples and pears were a little ahead of schedule. So it was late May um, and you could either spray then, but then the, the problem with spraying fruit trees, one problem, is you have to make repeat applications throughout the year. So the spray doesn't last very long. Even if it's a conventional spray, which is made from a synthetic chemical, it's gonna be typically two weeks that it lasts. So you're spraying every two weeks throughout the season to make sure that the codling moth isn't laying uh, eggs on there. So what, that's one reason we like the organza bags. We put those on early June and we leave them on all the way until harvest. Um, so organza bags, in our experience at least, don't work for peaches, nectarines, almonds, uh, apricots, anything that we call stone fruit. Um, so it depends on the year uh, what type of activity there is. Like uh, there's two there's two borers. There's one that's called um, peach twig borer and there's one that's called greater peach tree borer. Peach twig borer is kind of sporadic in Utah. So you might not have to worry about it. You might not even have to spray. So, um, you know, it's best to control pests if you have them. But in our case, we kind of wait to see if there is a pest. Um, if you do need to spray, there is an organic option. Spinosad is the active ingredient. Um, and you can spray that, but the, the, resi the, the residual on that is only about a week. So actually 10 days. So you, you would need to spray every 10 days or at exactly the right time. And you would have to time it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. So sign up for the pest advisories. And if you're not in Utah, yeah. most state extensions do something similar. Absolutely. California for sure, if there's anybody there. Um, but uh, most, you know, yeah, all the, all the extensions will know about the pests. If they don't send out an email advisory, then you can uh, contact the, the local county and they'll let you know. Exactly. That's a really underutilized resource, the yeah. state extension offices. State they extension. have a ton of information, um, and it's timely. They do it um, right when you need to know about it. Uh, right. We have another question about corn stalks. This person's just a little bit north of us, so a little north of Ogden. Okay. Um, and they have, it looks like, very large corn stalks, but the ears are tiny and don't seem to be growing. So the plant itself is big, but mm -hmm. the ears are small. Yeah. Um, if you're there and can answer real quick, when did you plant them? Like, is could it be early? Uh, says, I mean, usually you get a big stalk first, and then the plant, um, and this is just its genetic makeup. It decides when, depending on the variety, it decides when it's time to make the stalks. Um, if, what's that? When it's time to make the ears. When is time to make the ears? I'm sorry. Yeah. So it might just not have formed them yet. Um, but the gut ears are just tiny. And they're, okay. And they're not getting any bigger, sounds like. 
Um, hmm, they, corn is a heavy feeder. It could have not had enough uh, nitrogen uh, fertilizer, or you might have, if earlier, it's a little late now probably, but maybe it ran out of nitrogen. It could have also been environmental stress of some sort. Um, and uh, another thing that I think is, is uh, some people um, are, we, what, one thing that we should always think about is the amount of sunlight when it has to do with formation of plants because that's the energy for the plant. So if maybe they didn't have full sun, and you would know, if it had full sun, like meaning all day long sun, or at least eight hours uh, or more, ideally, corn likes a, likes a ton of sun. You know, they're out in, in fields where they're in sun all day usually. Um, that could prevent it from having enough energy to form full stalks. So those are my only ideas. You have Close any ideas? For pollination? Um, so it would probably not be small ears if it was a pollination problem. Okay. It could be, um, but a, well, a pollination problem for corn, usually what happens is the stalk could form fully, but then the kernels don't develop. Oh, okay. um, that's but that's definitely a, a factor growing corn. Anybody who's interested in corn, think about you kind of have to plant a really dense block because the wind pollinates them. So if you don't have enough corn plants, like one or two they won't pollinate and then you won't get full um what are those called the seed like the corn itself the, kernel. the kernels the kernels won't but develop north of here it could just be too early yeah it could be too early and they could be still still forming you know we planted an early variety and planted it really early started it from tr seed trays and we just uh had our corn uh last week. like Mostly last week it blew over. Mostly because it <laughs> blew over um but a lot of corn isn't ready yet I mean, it, depending on when it is planted and wh how long it may, takes. Would it be advisable to add any nitrogen at this point in the season? Um, I don't think the nitrogen, I don't know. You know, I don't think the nitrogen would, would help at this point, to be honest. Um, if it was a, a, like a slow release, a organic nitrogen especially, it wouldn't really hurt anything to, to maybe put a little in, but it, I wouldn't, unfortunately, I don't think it would help. Right. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Happy to answer questions. <laughs> I love answering questions, actually. You are best. As you can see, I like talking about this stuff, so, you know. Perfect. Um, so we already mentioned the farmer's market. If you're in Ogden, you could stop by and see us. Uh, and uh, check out TEDx Ogden for more information about the other speakers that are going to be there and to get your tickets. And I think that's about it. Okay. I'll go ahead and wrap it up real quick. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I'm John, Holly's behind the camera. If you missed the introduction, appreciate it. Apologies about the, uh, the internet signal loss. Thanks for bearing with us. Hopefully we answered as many questions as we could. If you still have a question, uh, let us know. Thanks for watching Foodscaping Utah and grow your own.